Hello and welcome to the Juana Juana podcast. If you're enjoying the show, consider signing up for the Patreon. There you get ad-free content, early access, exclusive episodes, and monthly supporter hangouts. You can find it at patreon.com slash the Juan on Juan podcast. If you don't like the subscription-based models, there are other ways of supporting the show that are linked in the description. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy this episode. They said it was forbidden. They said it was dangerous. They were right. Introducing the paranoid American homunculus owner's manual. Dive into the arcane, into the hidden corners of the occult. This isn't just a comic. It's a hidden tome of supernatural power. All original artwork illustrating the groundbreaking research of Juan Ayala, one of the only living homunculologists of our time. Learn how to summon your own homunculus, an enigma wrapped in the fabric of reality itself, their power at your fingertips, their existence, your secret. Explore the mysteries of the Aristotelian, the spiritual, the Paracelsian, the Crowleyan homunculus. Ancient knowledge lost to time, now unearthed in this forbidden tale. This comic book holds truths not meant for the light of day. Knowledge that was buried, feared, and shunned. Are you ready to uncover the hidden, the paranoid American homunculus owner's manual, not for the faint of heart? Available now from Paranoid American. Get your copy at tjojp.com or paranoidamerican.com today. Welcome to the One on One podcast with your host, Juan Ayala. Back to another episode of the one on podcast. I'm your host, as always. Make sure to follow the show on social media at the one on one podcast, tjojp.com. If you want more of the show, patreon.com slash the one on one podcast. Make sure to get your homunculus owner's manual from Paranoid American at tjojp.com. You can also get a copy of the Chosen Juan comic book. Cultist Monday, all that good stuff. And today joining us for the third or fourth time or fifth time, whatever, um, however many times it's been, my Mexican brother, exo exoteric, esoteric Eddie. What's up, bro? What up, what up? Good to be here. Thanks for having me again. My Puerto Rican brother. Yeah. <laughs> How you been, bro? Can you let people know where they can where they can follow you out, where they can find your work, where they can buy your books at? All that good stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You can find me on Instagram, Esoteric Eddie, YouTube, Esoteric Eddie TV. And uh, you can buy my books, merch, and pretty much everything on my website at www.esotericeddie.com. And it's important to put the www because for some reason, if you just put Esoteric Eddie, it hasn't been coming up lately. I'm trying to shadow ban me everywhere. <laughs> yeah, and for those that are always asking me about the hat, this is actually esoteric eddie merch so i've been rocking the esoteric eddie merch for a minute now but yeah that's that's interesting they're trying to right you have to put 666 in front of the esoteric mm -hmm. eddie.com to make it work because www translates to 666 which kind of sort of relates to what we're going to be talking about today a little bit of moloch a little bit of yahweh these are subjects dude like sometimes i'll be doing research into whatever topic and sometimes you think it's like too elementary, like too basic or too whatever. And like sometimes it's important to go back to those basic concepts and really pick it apart because there's plenty of, of meat left on the bones there to to like learn something new. And I had that recently happen to me with an episode I did on elementals where I thought I had picked everything apart from that subject. 
it turns out there was plenty on the bone and I was able to go down a deep rabbit hole as far as like elementals and all that went. So uh, this, this topic we're going to be talking about today, Yahweh and, and Moloch. And these are subjects that divide a lot of people, right? It's like these things that were, are we ever going to truly know the truth, Eddie? Like in your opinion, because there is a lot of historical references and in, in the video that you had put out, you put out a lot of, of sources hinting at perhaps, right? Moloch being Yahweh or vice versa, however you want to see it. But do you think we're ever going to truly know the truth? And there's people actually dying because of these, of these concepts in the Bible and in all these ancient religious scriptures, there's people unaliving other people because of certain things that are said. I mean, we know what's going on right now, the state of things in, in the world, but what are your opinion? Do you think we're ever going to really know? Do you think, what, what do you think happens when we pass on to the, to the next realm? Like when we're gone? <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Heavy hitting questions. Um, I think that we can know the truth about a lot of things in this life. You know, I think there's a lot of things in this life that we can know the truth about, but it just takes meticulous analyzing and studying and not just listening to the news or listening to the preacher or just seeing a simple Instagram or YouTube video about it. Like it, it's like guys like us, man, we, we dive into books, into PDFs, not just once, not just twice, but for years on end, dude, for nights on end. So it, what I've learned after 15 years of dedicating my life to being an independent uh, student, you know, independent researcher, what I've learned is, is most of the world is just, is, is, a uh, going off of surface level knowledge you know and so for example today's presentation we're going to learn very quickly how easily the knowledge of moloch was exaggerated and just ran with because people simply just took it for face value from the church from the preacher and stuff like that so yeah i think that we can know the truth about a lot of things in this life if we take the time to really analyze it and study it which most people don't do, which is why we're in the mess that we're in. And as far as what do I think what happens after we die? Oh, man. Uh, I think, well, I could give you the answer, my answer simply, but my answer is based off of a, a whole entire study having to do with consciousness, subconscious, the matrix. And, and my ideas of the afterlife have changed after the last book that I just put out. And the last documentary, last major documentary that I put out, um, The Crystal Lattice Mind Illusion. And that whole book and documentary is about consciousness, sub the subconscious, the simulation theory. And um, because of all that research and the many, many years of experiences I've had and everything in my life, I am now at this point in my life concluding that first and foremost, our our mind, our consciousness is what we really are. And we are simply interfacing in this life through the body, through the spirit machine. And we can experience a life after this, and we will. But the quality and of that experience and the context of that experience wholly depends on how fortified our minds are in this experience. If you don't take it upon yourself to fortify your mind and build that self-realization connection. Now you can't expect to just have that once you die, once you die. In other words, we are eternal beings. We are infinite, but you need to tap into that. You need to start tapping into that through certain practices with the body as well. And so that when you do pass over, it's going to be sort of like a dream. You will ease into it, but just like a dream, you, if you don't, if you're not aware through that process, you're going to lose yourself, your sense of self, and you're going to wake up in this another, this other dream and this other avatar, forgetting who you really are on that bed at wherever you're sleeping. It's the same concept. When we pass over, we need to be fortified in our minds and our self-realization so that when we pass over, we do so consciously. And I believe that once we pass over, that's just the beginning. There are so many dimensions out there that are waiting for us to experience. And so I think that's just the beginning crossing over consciously is just the beginning. And right now we are in school to prepare for that. I haven't checked out the, the, the latest book you had put out. I did buy it, but I haven't had a chance to read it. And 
what do you, what are your th- can this is just a question do you think that people can achieve and reach this other side without having to pass like guys in the bible like enoch and who was the other one was there was another guy in the bible who who went with god but did it was it ezekiel elijah. elijah 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 well do you think that people can achieve that sort of alignment to where they can pass on to the afterlife but without having been unalive themselves or whatever it is do you think that there is such such a school of thought or a school of philosophy like that that you can achieve that in the waking state i think so yeah i think so i mean to to cross over with this physical body this physical avatar um that i don't know i would like to believe that's possible and of course the stories of enoch and elijah tell us that it is possible but but not really, though, because the story of Enoch and Elijah, all they tell us is that they were taken up to the heavens, which means space. So there maybe or maybe they were crossed over to some quantum realm, some other dimension. So that's possible. But from my view, I think they were just taken up to space, some, you know, uh, abducted or whatever. But to actually cross over <laughs> to other dimensions <laughs> with this physical body, I don't know, because this physical body, this physical avatar is meant to be interfaced in this simulation, this reality. It all starts in the mind. That's the more important thing to understand. I think is that, is that we're consciousness, we're mind. So if we're going to do any traveling, it's going to be with the mind. And I think psychedelics teaches us that, you know, psychedelics, astral projection teaches us that is that the real way to travel is going to be through the mind, through the spirit body. Well, on this podcast, we believe that space, is fake and gay. So by that, <laughs> when you get abducted, are you automatically gay? Like, how does that work? And, and you know, are aliens? I think that's why it's alien grays because they're actually alien gays, and that's why yeah. they like to do butt stuff. What do you think? Yeah, what do you think yeah about I think that? once they probe, once they probe you, I think that's when <laughs> you cross over to the gay side. That's your initiation. Only if you like it, though. Only if you like it. Yeah, like some people are like, ooh, yeah. we'll do that again, please. So yeah, no, I, I think that it's interesting to think about all these things because they are such an integral part of reality. Literally it's inner, I call it interdimensional literature where these stories have shaped cultures. They have shaped entire eras, thousands of years, entire peoples. Like people will take this to the grave with them. And I feel like sometimes people focus so much on, on, well, when I was really heavily into the church, I consider myself a Christian, but not a practicing one, but, the idea of they focus so much on wanting to prepare for this afterlife and they don't enjoy this life too much. Right. It's like, Oh, you know, you just be good now. And it's like, well, you also have to enjoy life. Obviously don't do bad things, but I think people sometimes are very superstitious when it comes to that. I I don't know about now. A lot of the Christians that I've seen now are very laxed. Like there's like Christian nightclubs and stuff like that, that I've seen on, on the internet. So that didn't exist when I was going to church. So, But it's just interesting that people are attracted to, and I've always said this, like Apocrypha too, the the apocalypse, the end times, all these concepts that we've been, that come from these stories, right? Like the the book Revelation, one of the first stories I ever read and how psychedelic and trippy that story is, bro. Like how, how bizarre and the imagery that's using, it's very alchemical in nature, the whole uh, book of Revelation. So you want to get started with the presentation today on the Moloch and Yahweh? So I can pull it up here. Yeah, man, absolutely. Just give me a sec. Yeah. So, yeah, we're going to be talking about the similarities of Moloch and Yahweh and how potentially one could be the other, you know, however you want to say it. And Eddie really does make a good case when it comes to this. And again, these are questions that obviously we weren't there for, but there is a lot of scripture revolving around these concepts and these ideas yeah, that man. go back thousands of years. If if you want to believe the the church fathers and all these people, right? Because it's essentially it's you said abducted earlier, but almost like okay. these are these are. The, the way that they say it, the way I've seen it, puts like, oh, the angel took over the hand of such and such scribe and he wrote this down. It's like, well, that sounds like, dude, that sounds like channeling to me, man. 
I'm saying like having, oh, you know, you know, he had a vision, bro. It's the same thing, you know? So what makes yours religious and then mine blasphemous, but that yours is older than mine. (laughs) And then you got more, you got a bigger fan base in your club than mine. You know what I'm saying? Like that's, that's, that's why religion sometimes really blows my mind. I'm not saying the Bible's fake and gay, but I'm, I'm just, man is, can be fake and gay and he can put stuff in there that, that wouldn't otherwise be true. You know what I'm saying? Like he'll corrupt it yeah. and he'll make it, you know, towards the more about pro it. You, uh, one time somebody told me, Oh, once you start making it about money, you stop becoming a prophet, like a prophet. And you it's, it becomes about profits, like profit money. So I think that's yeah, what yeah. happened in this whole, uh, organized religion. It went from the profits of foretelling these events to profits about, the greenbacks or the, the Benjamins baby, you know, I think mm-hmm. that's what happened. I agree, man. That's actually quite literally what happened. Um, actually in the Lucifer book that I dropped years ago, there's a part in there where I talk about how the church went from how it transitioned from um, the people selecting the priest and or whatever to the priest institution itself, then uh, selecting it, its successors. And that's when shit got corrupt because now people were bribing the priest, like, yo, let me be up next. Let me be up next. <laughs> so that, that literally what happened is it all turned from the people choosing to uh, the um, the priest, the institution, yeah. then choosing who, who gets to succeed. But uh, yeah, man, we can get into it and, and we're going we're gonna, to uh, deconstruct and deprogram a whole other thing today too. Awesome, bro. So Moloch and Yahweh, Esoteric Eddie, Ancient Sacrifice. Absolutely. For sure. Before we get started, I just want to say, because I know a lot of people are going to be asking in the comments later on, well, what about Alex Jones and Bohemian Grove? Because people were already asking me that um, on the documentary that I made. And first and foremost, I mean, Alex Jones, obviously, OG pioneer, did a lot for the space and everything. But Bohemian Grove, as we'll see, is connected to moloch but the owl has nothing to do with moloch so the the owl that they were worshiping at bohemian grove is not moloch because moloch has always been represented as a bull you know and and so that owl is something wholly different and if you actually watch the the ritual video which i have on my channel they don't ever mention moloch nothing near next to moloch so that's just a whole different thing but it is similar as we'll see I'm going to be honest right, with you. So- I'm kind of retarded. Why is that, though? <laughs> it ha- has it been co- – because, I mean, I know the Bohemian Grove owl, the logo has an owl. But that that rock, it's been confirmed that it is an owl, right? That it is the, the silhouette of an owl? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can see it in pictures. And maybe the connection there that it could be uh, considered a horned owl. So mm-hmm. if it's a horned owl, then maybe it's like a play on Moloch, the bull, and that kind of stuff. But mm-hmm. in my opinion, it's not Moloch. It couldn't be Moloch because, as we'll see in this presentation, there actually never really was a Moloch. And mm-hmm. so it, it's, again, just, just these different plays on archetypes, imagery, and stuff like that. Um, but nonetheless, it doesn't, that doesn't make the fact that they what, they what they were doing isn't crazy and, and satanic, you know? Yeah, yeah, 100%. An ancient sacrifice being one of these things I've referred to before as a sort of technology. I think that the idea i mean you can get into a whole bunch of philosophies uh, to it but the idea of snuffing out a essentially a power source or a light and then you can use that energy and transmute it to do other things with it i mean that's essentially it and when you get into what was the i think there was i think it was paranoid american one time was uh, we did an episode on fritz springmeyer book and he was talking about how human sacrifice and blood sacrifice are two different things like blood. You're offering up the right, the medium, the 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 vital force, I guess, of you. Uh, you know, you can think of it like cutting your palm and making a pact and throwing it over a fire or whatever. And then a human sacrifice. Well, I mean, you, you, ch- you just chuck the whole baby in there. You don't have to worry about about bleeding it out before you put it in the fire. Right. And again, these yeah. things are used in ceremonial. Ceremonial settings to invoke a higher change essentially that's that's the way i've come to understand it yeah pretty much and as we'll see you know the, our ancient people were, were sacrificing for pretty much the same reason the reason they were doing these sacrifices is in hopes of gaining something from the gods some sort of luck some sort of fortune but this presence this whole presentation is basically premised around the idea 
or the question, was Moloch real? Was Moloch real? That's the question I had. That's what I set out to achieve to answer. And uh, I found my answer. So, but this, it all starts with, with ancient sacrifice. You know, was there any ancient sacrifice really happening? And according to a lot of sources, there, there definitely was ancient human and child sacrifice happening. Um, I got about four uh, witnesses and sources on the screen right now. Um, one being Clytarchus of Carthage, Diodorus Siculus from Greece, Tertullian, uh, one of the early Christian fathers, and a later 19th century uh, traveler, Robert Pashley. And so if we go to the next slide, we'll get into what Clytarchus had to say. So Clytarchus, which is a pretty pretty badass name, I think. I don't know. It was, it was a pretty weird name, Clytarchus. But he's from uh, the 4th century BC. So this is one of the oldest accounts that we have of human sacrifice. And I have the quote on the screen. And uh, I'll just quickly uh, paraphrase it. But he basically says that in, Car in Carthage, which was a, a Phoenician or Canaanite um, you know, uh, branch, he, he mentioned that there was this bronze brazier, you know, this bronze statue in which there was a, a furnace which children were thrown into. And uh, he talks about, at, and he describes that as the, the bodies were being burned, their mouths would like start to like shrivel up into this weird smile, this weird smile. And it was actually um, a term that was used in ancient times called the sardonic smile. Like, oh, they have the sardonic smile. I don't know. It was like a term for like evil smile. But, but as these babies would shrink because of the fire, like there's, there's mouths would turn into this weird smile thing. And so that's one of the first or the one of the earliest accounts we have of human sacrifice coming from Clytarchus. But as we see in the description, there is no mention of a Moloch. If we go to the next one, it's a similar situation coming from Diodorus Siculus, um, the Greek, the Greek writer from the first century BC. He again talks about this bronze statue um, of Cronus with its hands extending outward and its palms facing up in which uh, parents would throw their children onto for uh, a sacrifice and so but again in this description we don't see anything having to do with moloch or a bull per se in this specific case uh, we're told that it was a statue of cronus who was uh just a rendition of saturn as well and the next one comes from Tertullian. Tertullian coming from the second century AD, Common Era, one of the earliest uh, Christian Christian writers, and he tells us in uh, his uh, what's known as the Apology of Tertullian. I don't have his quote up on the screen, but I know that in his Apology, he talks about uh, different cases around the world of human sacrifice, and one in specific in Africa, northern Africa, which was actually a Phoenician and Canaanite city, a Carthage city that there was human sacrifice done to Saturn. And again, Saturn was a rendition of Cronus. And so in all of these accounts, we do have human sacrifice, child sacrifice um, to these bronze statues or whatever, but none of them are to Moloch or a bull-like deity per se. Now, Robert Pashley was a 19th century traveler who wrote in his book, Travels in Crete. And I quote here, the traditions respecting Talos, which was, uh, again, this other like strange mythological creature that bronze statues were made of, would alone lead us to suppose that Crete once possessed as its chief deity a Moloch, horrid king, besmeared with blood of human sacrifice and parents' tears. Now, the only reason Moloch is used in this description is because this is from the 19th century hundreds of years, hundreds of thousands of years, almost um, since the Bible was written, the Old Testament was written. So he already knew about Moloch. So he was referencing Moloch because that's the way we viewed the past and the sacrifices. I think but as we now know, go ahead. I think Talos is where we get the word talisman from, if I'm not mistaken. This was that huge statue, no? And talus yeah. Tal and gi giant automaton made of bronze to protect Europa in Crete from the pirates and invaders. And I, I believe the story goes that his, his body was broken down and melted into the first coins. I could be completely wrong, but there are coins with the depiction of him on it. So I'm trying to find the story, but I can't find it right now. Yeah. I touch on Talos a little bit in the documentary and, and later in this presentation too, because his story 
kind of influenced the Moloch one also. Mm-hmm. We have and Talos uh, connects to the Argonauts too, which right the Golden Fleece, which is very it's all very alchemical and and enigmatic in nature. Yeah, man. Yeah, so we have all those ancient sources and, and references to ancient uh, human sacrifice, baby sacrifice, but all of it's done in the name of Cronus or Saturn or some other god, Mata Moloch. And so Moloch in specific comes from us comes to us from the Bible. The Bible is like the number one source for the archetype and story of Moloch. And in the Bible, um, we are told that Moloch was worshipped in Gehenna. And Gehenna is is the Greek word for um, uh, the valley of the son of Hinnom. And uh, get, so Gehenna, I think I'm getting that correctly, but um, nonetheless, Gehenna is this, was this valley in ancient Israel, also known as the valley of the son of Hinnom. And in that valley is where the Moloch sacrifice took place. And so people would meet up there and and erect these statues of Moloch, these bull-like statues, and then sacrifice their children there. And uh, all throughout the New, the New Testament, Jesus frequently refers to Gehenna when he speaks about the afterlife and, and the punishment for sinners. And I made a whole other video on this you can find on my channel called Hell is Not Real. And Jesus, he whenever he speaks about hell, he uses the word Gehenna, because of course the word hell isn't actually in the Bible. The word Gehenna is. And Gehenna, again, is this valley where people worshipped Moloch and sacrificed their children. And so Jesus said that the afterlife for sinners will be like Gehenna, and that the sin, the soul of the sinners will be destroyed forever. Not punished forever, but destroyed forever. And so that's a whole different conversation, um, but you can watch the video if you like to get more info on that. And so the Bible is, again, where the, the number one source for the archetype and story of Moloch. And it starts with Gehenna, the valley of, son, of the son of Hinnom. And also we are told frequently throughout the Bible that the worship of Moloch was banned and anybody who continued it would be put to death, such as in Leviticus 20. We are told, again, anybody who worships Moloch will be put to death, so on and so forth. So all of this Moloch stuff comes from the Bible specifically. And... So we have here the book of Revelation describes Hades or Hades being cast into the lake of fire, Revelation 2014. The King James Version is the only English translation in modern use to translate Sheol, Hades, Tartarus, and Gehenna as hell. So there's a translation problem going on here in the New Testament, the New International Version, New Living Translation, New American Standard Bible, among others. All reserve the term hell for the translation of Gehenna or Tartarus, transliterating Hades as a new term directly from the equivalent Greek term. That's, you know, and this is a problem with with religion as well. There's there's people expect back again to that man aspect. We're imperfect. You have such differences in etymologies and languages throughout all of these different cultures and religions and, and peoples and all this stuff. And how do you expect to get the full hundred percent truth? If the stuff that you're reading to begin with was corrupted, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, and people will take that. Like some people only want to read the King James version. Well, what the, what if the King James version just, you know, put everything aside for one second is wrong like what if it's wrong the words that are being told to you are wrong does that discredit the entire bible altogether if if let's say 50 percent of the stuff has been changed right and i mean a scribe yeah. that is sitting in front is like hmm well i want to use this word today and he puts that word instead of the other one does that take away yeah. what does god have to say about that you know what i'm saying like what does that not not diminish the message at all you know yeah so oh yeah man just very interesting that the I did not I did not I'm learning this now but yeah you're absolutely right it is uh, in the New Testament referred to uh, the King James Bible the term appears 13 times and in 11 different verses of the Valley of Hanan Valley of the Son of Hanan and Valley of the Children of Hanan so yeah yeah and I just remember Gehenna is the Greek version of Gai Ben Hanom so Gai Ben Hanom is the Hebrew Valley of the Son of Hanom. And also interesting, uh, just another fact that's in the video I made. So it used to be used as a worship for Moloch. And then after that was um, 
prohibited, it became a trash dump, a <laughs> dump where people would just go and burn their trash instead of their children, thank God. But that trash dump became so like perilous and like full of toxic waste that it, it started spreading disease. And mm. so it like burned another like disastrous archetype in the subconscious mind of the early Israelites. So it just had a whole bad rap. But funny now, it's actually like a beautiful tourist site. You can just walk through it. Uh, and I was going to ask you, the the Kronos, this Kronos character, do you know how far back, do you have a date as to how far back he's referenced? Because we have the Roman equivalent, which is Saturn, which I've heard people say before that, oh, what, did they, what have I said? Saturn and Kronos aren't the same thing. I've heard that before. So you have Ro Roman equivalent Saturn, Egyptian equivalent Geb, Mesopotamian equivalent Ninurta and Enlil. So that, bro, this goes man, this goes back far. But how can we trust oh, yeah. that it's the same archetype or character and not? It know, takes a lot up? of like, it takes just a lot of like just meticulous studying, dude. And. Uh, I, it's been a while since I've traced that one. Zechariah Sitchin, of course, was, was like the pioneer of all that, like tracing all these different mythologies back to the Anunnaki and stuff. But um, during the research of this project, like I, I found that a lot of this stuff, a lot of this Moloch stuff, at least, which is tied into Saturn and Cronus, goes back to the, the early Mes Mesopotamian Anunnaki tales again. Um, and it's because we got to understand that like it all starts there, right? It all started in Mesopotamia, a lot of this like mythology stuff at least, and then branched outward and then started to just change with the translations, with the cultural context and stuff like that. As we'll see, I'll get more into that towards the end of the video or the end of the pre presentation as to how this stuff ties into the Mesopotamian stuff. Yeah. And, and Mesopotamia, I mean, we can get into it towards the end, but that's as far that's the latest thing that we've found or mainstream mm -hmm. says is the oldest. Cause I mean, isn't Gobekli yeah. Tepe older than Mesopotamia? I could be wrong on that. Yeah. Yeah. So I always like to say our modern timeline is 7,000 years, right? That's mm -hmm. all the way back to the Sumerians is 7,000 years. But we know for a fact now that there are remnants, human remnants, civilization remnants going way further back than that. Like wow. you said, Gobekli Tepe. So there are remnants, but there are no texts. We have yet to find any text. Mm. But Gobekli, Dep Gobekli Tepe does have uh, in uh, images, weird images of animals. One of them being what looks like to be a Degasaurus. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, uh, yeah, Gobekli Tepe goes back to 11,523 years, founded 9,500 BCE. So, yeah, that's oh, yeah. a lot further back than mainstream history interesting so yeah, dude. this evidence we have here yeah so yeah so we right we have we have these different sources saying yep human sacrifice baby sacrifice was happening but none of it's mentioning moloch and then we have the bible though it's over here saying that moloch was real moloch was real um well so what's the evidence so in 1920s there was a french team um who uh, was analyzing some some strange grave sites in Carthage. And so Carthage was a part of the Phoenician Empire. And more specifically, North Africa had a Carthage uh, precinct there. And um, amongst Carthage, we found one of uh, one of these sites at one of these sites, we found 20,000 jars, about 20,000 jars, which were filled with bones belonging to babies and children. And these sites, these grave sites, these sacrificial grave sites are what are now known as tofets. And these, so these tofets are these sacrificial grave sites where, like, as you can see, thousands, tens of thousands of, of babies were born or, or uh, sacrificed. And as we, as of right now, we found nine of these different tof tofets around um, the Middle East and Mediterranean areas, three in North Africa, which again was a Phoenician um, precinct. And two in Sicily, Italy, and four in Sardinia, Italy. So all in these like Mediterranean, northern African sites, which were a Western precinct of the expanding Phoenician Empire back in the ancient times. And so among these tofets and among these jars, we found other interesting things that lead to these Moloch or supposed Moloch sacrifices. And in my documentary, I analyzed a pretty cool paper that was put together by Caitlin De Benedetto, 
titled Analyzing Tophets. Did the Phoenicians practice child sacrifice? And it's it's a it's a high academic academic paper. And in this paper, she talks about these different experiments or um yeah, these different experiments on the evidence and what the conclusion was. And she realized that the bones and the teeth of these tofets were exposed to high heat, extreme heat. And she realized that 87% of these bones and teeth, these babies, uh, were exposed to heat above 700 degrees Celsius. So they were deliberately being thrown into high, high temperatures, which kind of reflects these ancient uh, accounts of these bronze statues and altars and stuff like that. And even creepier than that, on a lot of these tofets, on a lot of these jars are inscriptions and one of the inscriptions we, we read, as I have on the screen, that the, some of these babies were specifically sacrificed to Sire Baal Haman, Lord of the Sky. I have dedicated Eris, or Aris, son of Hannah, because you have heard my voice. So just classical ancient human craziness. <laughs> you know, just throwing our babies in the fire to, yet again, Babylonian gods. And for the American listener, that's 1,292 degrees Fahrenheit. So talk about Celsius. And I believe I saw a documentary a while back about this. And I think it might have been with the remains that they had found where they tested it because they were trying to prove, again, this whole thing. Because sometimes a lot of the accounts, too, that we have, like when you're when you're reading about indigenous groups right and they're being conquered by the conquistadors or whoever it was in history right they were they were taking over the other people they would usually be they were taking over from like this religious perspective like oh god sent us here to you know spread the gospel or whatever it was you know christianize these people etc etc and a lot of things that they were writing would be over embellished like yo they're doing this black magic dark art to have a shaman but mind you it's indigenous people that were more there were pagans they would you know they had their their nature god and their nature spirits and they had the shaman class that was though there were the ones that would interact with the the other side right the spirit realm which is kind of sort of the same thing nowadays if you really look at it where the preacher or the pastor or the pope if you want to go that whole route these people they're the ones that interact with deity or source or the other side meanwhile you're just this regular lay person you know you're you're in society you're a civilian whatever it is so it's not that different. The only thing that really changes is, you know, in God we trust to them means something else. And maybe they're polytheistic or whatever. But oh, yeah. a lot of these stories were also over embellished. What are your thoughts on that of like maybe this a lot of the stuff that we hear about could have been these people exaggerating to make them their people look better, almost like a nationalistic type of, of view. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, actually, that's pretty spot on. And that's actually a part of this presentation, as we'll see. Um, but I want to go back to what you said. Yeah, oh, yeah, the whole thing about in, uh, we'll actually go back to the other slide. I think I still had a couple other things on there. Um, oh, yeah, one other thing. But before I finish this slide, I want to get back to what you just said. Uh, oh, yeah, in God we trust. I just made a reel about this on my Instagram. It's funny because we have that on, on our dollar bill, right? In God we trust. But um, they don't, they're not talking about the Christian God. I mean, everyone the assumes. I, yeah, everybody assumes. And the reason I think that is because on the sea, on the obverse of the great seal, which is the pyramid in the eye, we have annuit coeptus novus ordo seclorum. And of course we know that means uh, may he favor our undertaking through this new order of the ages. That is a direct quote from the Aeneid, the Aeneid being um, the Roman mythological tale. Whoa. And that, yeah, and those words were spoken by the son of Aeneas, and Aeneas was the father of Rome. And so those words were spoken by the son of Aeneas before he he uh, slew his enemy, and he said those words to his god, Jupiter. Ooh. So he was saying, Jupiter, may you favor our undertaking in this new order of the ages, right before he slew his enemy. And so the god they're trusting in isn't isn't the Christian god, if we if we take that for face value the god that they're trusting in is jupiter which is the roman god and, and it, i've always said that they're that the people worship miscellaneous gods not that there's anything wrong with that but people automatically assume in god we trust it is talking about right the abrahamic right jesus christ or god whoever whatever you right 
And that's the thing. That's the thing about chaos magic, which it could be whatever you want and some too, right? So that they, we're dealing with magicians that are very skilled in mimetic magic, if you will, where they take concepts that make you believe it's one thing. Meanwhile, they're substituting it for something completely different behind the scenes. And that was the original intention of it, right? So people have to understand that some t some of the things that you use are occultic in nature, have occultic origins, and maybe you are passing on unknowingly the original the uh, the original intention of these magicians or whatever you want to call it, right? Like the idea of of money, and if you've ever read Twyman's research on that and the origins of of the monetary system and how maybe perhaps child sacrifice is sac the sacrifice of the next generation, right? With debt, with whatever else. And I mean, it's very, again, very alchemical in nature, but absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, man. And last thing on the slide too, another uh, piece of evidence that points to these tofets found around the world being specifically for child sacrifice was the fact that we found a lot of jewelry, a lot of like amulets and jewelry and stuff like that, along with these jars, which basically says that the, these babies were given up as offerings along with the jewelry to these mm -hmm. Babylonian gods, Baal Haman, and so on and so forth. But yeah, um, so the Moloch, this, so this conundrum with Moloch, was he real, was he not? It all starts with the root word for the word Moloch itself. Now, the root word for Moloch is MLK. And every word in Hebrew as many of us know, um, does not have vowels. Every Hebrew word only has consonants. And because of that, these, these root words can be translated into various words depending on the context. So MLK, mulk, can be translated into malek, malik, and milkom. Or those are just a few examples. And all of those, malek, malik, milkom, are all royal titles. And for example, when Jesus is called King of Kings in Hebrew, that would be read as Melech Malkai Ham Malakim. All of those coming from the root word M L K, Mulk. Another example of this comes out of T. E. Colebrook's um, historical book titled On Imperial and Other Titles, in which he says, as I quote, the famous Saladin bore the title of Sultan as well as Malik, his full title as it appears on his coins runs the Malik, the defender of the faith. And Malik, Malek, um, and Milcom all pretty much mean like king, ruler, stuff like that. And so the word Moloch also comes from this root word MLK. As we'll see, that plays a huge part in the whole uh, conundrum and confusion of the archetype of Moloch itself. And this also plays into the role of like Baal, which is also like a title. You have, I think L is also a title. All is a, is another title. And when I was listening to this on the documentary, I'm like, MLK, it's interesting that we're talking about Moloch, the god of child sacrifice. And then MLK was sacrificed too, essentially. I mean, by the government. Yeah. So they play out these these dramas in real life. And I think that's what they, they want to emulate, right? To To like the King kill 33 ritual. They take that energy and they, they sacrifice the King and they use that for something else. You know, they, they, they pass it on. So interesting. That's MLK. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's funny you say that too, how they want to play it out because that's, I'll get into that later too. Like that's a whole another part of this whole Moloch thing. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, the reason why they're doing these sacrifices, one, at least one reason was because they were reenacting and, and playing out some of the tales of their gods in which they sacrificed their children too. Yeah, like but Bohemian Grove. That. It was supposed to yep. allegedly a, a play, right? Well, it was an effigy. It wasn't even real. They were burning, right? It's about it's about the law of correspondence. So sympathetically, yeah. in a sympathetic magical way, it's still linked to the original. That's what people have to understand. Mm, yeah. Yeah, so getting back to the Bible, right? The, the Bible is the main source for this Moloch archetype and story and in the bible we are told that the ammonites specifically worshipped moloch and were specifically condemned because of that and the ammonites are a weird people we're told in the bible that their lineage started between an incestuous relationship between lot the uh nephew of abraham and lot's own daughter and so the the line of ammonite of the ammonites was already you know pretty twisted to begin with 
And uh, but there is some historical evidence of the Ammonites being a real people. And one of these is, is the Amon Citadel inscription. And in the Amon Citadel inscription, which was found in 1961, we find mentions of this god named Milcom. And again, Milcom being a root a word with the same root word, MLK, as Moloch. And in this inscription, it's, it's like a, just a basic inscription about them building some kind of worshiping structure for Milcom. And also among uh, the inscription, we found Ammonite seals, seals belonging to Ammonite kings. And in these seals, there are different theophoric names. A theophoric name is a name that incorporates the worship of a god. Like, I don't know, it's a strange example, but like in Spanish, like Jesucito, I don't know, it's a very common name, like in our community. And of course, that's a theophoric name relating to like Jesus, you know, but uh, in these different theophoric seals, a lot of them refer back to Milcom, one of them being uh, Milcom Yat. There was a king, an Ammonite king named Milcom Yat, and that name means may Milcom come, <laughs> may he come or whatever, gotta, you know. Gotta make him. Make them come. Got to milk them for the for the come. <laughs> uh, yeah, oh, they were perverse. I mean, this guy's talking about doing it with his with his daughter. So I mean, I wouldn't put it past them. They like, yo, let's troll the centuries. Let's write this inscription, which I think happened a lot of times too, bro. What if uh, we're taking this stuff like so seriously? We're we're trying to make mythologies and all. This. What if back then this was just fan fiction? These guys were just bored AF, and they were just like, yo. Let's write some stuff, man. Let's let's freak people out. Let's let's bury this stuff here. It's a time cap. Let's bury it here and see what happens, you know, three thousand years from now, whatever. They're gonna think that we were the dude. first peoples, bro, you know? <laughs> oh, I know, dude. I know I laugh at that too. Like we're always like over there inspecting these caves, like look at these people who were like trying to say like the aliens abducted them or whatever and like like all along 3000 years ago some dude just scribbling on a cave just bored or whatever <laughs> eating his boogers but, like yeah they're gonna think we're so advanced <laughs> yeah like oh we're gonna draw these weird things today God, you know man. or like a thousand years from now we're gonna people are gonna find a bunch of mcdonald's everywhere and be like huh they must have been worshiping at these strange centers yes. with these big golden m's absolutely it's like this this skull of a man and it turns out it was like I, it identified and had 50 pronouns as whatever it was. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> yeah. I identify as a spider pig. So hell so, yeah, yeah, dude. Fucking, um, where was I here? Oh yeah. So, so among the Ammonites, right. We have all these, uh, seals and, and references to Milcom again, no Moloch, but Milcom. And, um, but what's interesting too is the Bible itself never mentioned Moloch either. Moloch is a Greek rendition of the Bible's word Molech, mm. and the, so the words the Bible specifically used Molech. For example, in Leviticus eighteen twenty one, as I have on the screen, so on and so forth. Do not let your descendants pass through the fire of uh, to Molech. And there's a specific reason why this is used, because the Ammonites as we now know, we're referring to their gods as Melech or Milcom. And those were, well, those were words that the early Israelites were also using to refer to their god, Yahweh. We see this all throughout the Bible. You know, Yahweh is a Melech. He's known as a Melech, a Malik, a king, a ruler, the king of kings, all this. And so, um, at, like a lot of the early Hebrew writers, they quirkly they were they were quirky you know they, they played around with words a lot they they were like word word players wordsmiths mm -hmm. and stuff like that and so what they did was they took the ammonite word melech and inserted the the o there playfully using the same o pronunciation as their word boseth which means shame and so they were saying you don't have a melech you have a molech you have a shameful god and so, does Solomon did Solomon worship Molech or Moloch? Because I know at one point he left an offering on the on the altar of one of his concubines. They were pagans, right? And yeah. Did he worship Molech or Moloch? Technically, Molech. They yeah, all the the Bible in the in the Hebrew uh, text in the Old Testament. It's all Molech. There's no Moloch in the Hebrew. Moloch is a, is the Greek version of Molech. I think I know what's so happening, all, though, bro. I think I, I can see it because they were like, you got a, you know, Millicum, right? No Moloch. Yeah. 
bro. Like no homo, like no Moloch, bro. So that's why they changed. Yeah. Like, all right, let's change it to Molech. I think that's what happened there, dude. A play yeah, on yeah. words. A play on words. Yeah, they they knew, they knew what they were doing, bro. Yeah, exactly. And and when it comes to Sol- Solomon, he did worship Molech, Moloch, whatever. And uh, interestingly, right, he the reason he did so is because he he merged the Israelites with the Ammonite kingdom. He actually like um befriended or whatever the ammonite kingdom and allowed them to merge with the israelite kingdom and so he kind of took on their weird worshiping and really? sex rituals and yeah so, yeah, so were, the ammonites were these like the equivalent in the movie 300 where it's like that circus of people or was it Xerxes? is it xerxes the god king or whatever where all his people are deformed yeah. you know like they're like that one yeah. hunchback guy that betrays him he's like he's like a like a What's that one from Lord of the Rings? My precious. What's that guy's name? Oh, Gollum. Gollum, like that guy right there, or Gollum, whatever. I'm thinking of that one. I'm thinking of these Ammonites. I'm thinking of like Hills Have Eyes, incestual, like deformed people, yeah. you know? Like weird. That, yeah, the, the Hills Have Ammonites. <laughs> yeah, dude. That's what I'm thinking when I'm thinking of these people that, since you said that. That's interesting, though. Yeah, dude. Hills Have Ammonites. But yeah, I'll, so... All that's coming from that, man. And so, <clears throat> so getting back to this root word, MLK, right? So MLK and the Tophets. So these Tophets that we found that Caitlin Benedetto wrote about and, and all that stuff, all these different Tophets, we, we find the root word MLK, but in different variations. And I'm going to just read verbatim here what she had to say about that. Um, she said there's three variations of the root word MLK throughout these different Tophets and these different these three different categories determine what that specific sacrifice was used for. So she says the first type is mulk mur or mulk imor, which refers to the sacrifice of a lamb or a kid as a substitute offering for a child. A kid meaning uh, anywhere from one to like six years old, as opposed to an infant. The second is mulk baal or mulk baal, which refers to the sacrifice of a Baal, which was the child of an estate-owning or wealthy mercantile family. The final type, not found at Carthage, is Mulk Deum, or Mulk Adam, which refers to the sacrifice of a commoner. So among these tofets, these ritual sacrifice grave sites, were categories of MLKs, of sacrifices, and they had to be... Um, you know, determined or, or, you know, set apart. Like, yo, this one's for, this one's a commoner, just a regular kid, you know, throw them in that one. And this one's for a rich person, throw them in that one or whatever, because they were just crazy like that. I'm making a meme right now, bro. It's going to be the car salesman slapping the top of the cars. You can fit so many babies in this, in this (laughs) Moloch than you can. Do you want the, the base model or do you want the platinum model because it's going to cost you if you want the platinum model if you want the higher sacrifice you're gonna have to pay some more gold coins bro okay so that's that's interesting that they would grade their sacrifices and yeah and put the right say so this is the super sport you can have the super sport for this much for 30 <laughs> 33 gold coins and have we ever found any of these furnaces or statues depicting this this bullheaded god at all do you know if we've ever found like legitimately like these depictions that we see of of Moloch? i know there's the one over at the vatican that looks really bizarre but have we ever even really found any to begin with so i'm glad you asked no dude we have not found any of these altars and again, we haven't found any, none of these sacrifices in ancient times refer to a Moloch. That's all coming from the Bible. And as I go through this presentation, it's going to become more clear as to what was going on. So again, just to recap, what we know for sure, again, ancient sacrifice was happening, right? Um, and that the root word for Moloch was found among these sacrifices, right? MLK, Mulk. And as we see, it was used to categorize the different types of sacrifices, but we haven't found in the, any of these uh, bronze statues or anything like that. And so um, if we get to the next slide. So source, trust me, bro, pretty much is what you're telling me, bro. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the Bible, that's what the Bible's saying. It's like, yo, trust me, man, these people were worshiping Moloch and stuff like that. But again, the Bible wasn't never said Moloch. It said Molech, mm-hmm. and it was a play on the word Malek. It was saying, you guys don't have a king. You have a, a, a Molech, a, a shameful king. And so um, this guy here on the screen, though, 
So Otto Eisfeld was a German writer, a German author, a German researcher in the early 20th century, who's one of the first people to realize that maybe there never was a Moloch, but maybe the root word MLK, Mulk, Moloch, was actually referring to a type of sacrifice rather than a deity altogether. Mm. And when we plug that in, it starts to make sense. And that's why we don't find any references to Moloch in ancient times, but we do find the root word Mulk. And so what he postulated was that there never was a Moloch. There was just simply a Mulk, a type of sacrifice that these people were making to their gods, whether it was Saturn, Kronos, Milcom, so whatever, whatever. They were making, they were performing a Mulk. They were performing a Moloch rather than performing a sacrifice to Moloch. And yeah. he wrote about this extensively, and a lot of stories in his time, some or at least some of them were 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 siding with him. Okay, yeah, yeah, they thought, and a lot of other people were like, "No, nah, you're crazy," because it starts to open up a whole nother uh, debate as to okay, or what never was a Moloch, and they were just simply making a mulk sacrifice to their gods. <laughs> were, did the is early Israelites also do mulk sacrifices to their god? And that's what Otto Eisfeld started to question. He said, well, there's a lot of weird stuff in the early Bible and a lot of stuff in early Israelite history that points to the fact that they were also partaking in these ritual sacrifices. And by definition, as we'll see, they were specifically the early Israelites practicing mulk sacrifices as well, meaning that they were also sacrifice, doing, uh, performing Moloch sacrifices. Boom. Slaps the top of the car. You can fit so many sacrifices in this bad boy. How many you want? So this is a depiction. <laughs> <laughs> Hell from yeah, back dude. then. So and that's interesting, right? It's like it doesn't change the fact that they were still doing what was said was being done. If yeah. it doesn't change it from the perspective oh well they didn't use a bowl, right? They didn't use a a golden bowl, whatever it was. They didn't use a uh whatever it was that they were and there's no more slides after this one but i don't know if you know that there's only yeah yeah actually that's my fault but i got my notes up here all right cool so i'll just wing it yeah, after that actually but... i ran out of time i was like fuck so i couldn't no, you're the rest good. of the slide but we're all we're about more than halfway done through the presentation so um but yeah dude so so that's where things kind of get even more interesting and start to make more sense so we start to realize okay there never really was a moloch but it all it all centers around that root word mulk mlk and otto eisfeld wrote about that and other people have followed since then um who have also wrote about it did you write a book uh, about it do you have the name of that book the book that he wrote it's in it's in german dude yeah it's it's oh, I, can, I can i got the tech bro i can I can translate. get it, get it. Yeah, yeah. It's it's in German. Otto Eisfeld. Something to do with Moloch. If you type in his name in Moloch, it might show How up. How do you spell his name? Otto Eisfeld. We'll we'll translate it for the people so they can read it. All right, we got we got the tech, bro. We got the tech. There we go. The book has four sacrifices. Yeah, so that that does change a lot, and it's interesting how you're saying a lot of the things that you wouldn't otherwise know by actually digging at these basic this is like this is like one of the first things i got into when when getting into the whole conspiracy realm or or alternative esoteric occult thought because this is this is the occult essentially that these things aren't made clear enough within what we're being taught because how many if if the if the preacher talked about these sort of things at at church i'd probably show up once or twice more you know what i'm saying because that we're getting into the meat and bones of things. We're getting down into the nitty gritty, which is good to know because usually these people back then, they probably just were practicing things because it was this tradition, if you will, of the peoples before them, but they never understood what exactly they were doing. Well, what if this deity never existed and it was just an identification of which, how good your sacrifice was or whatever the, the case may be, you know, like that, that changes it quite a lot, bro. <laughs> like that, that, is a big difference versus like, Hey, there's a whole deity. He's like, no, no, no. But this is just like levels. What do you mean? Yeah. yeah. It's like, no, it's just, just levels of it. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, man, for sure. And, uh, I felt he pretty much realized that that was the case <clears throat> because we had found other Punic texts, other Phoenician texts with that root word 
specifically having to do with sacrifices. And again, none of them have to do with Moloch or anything like that. One of these being the third century BC Nebi Yunus inscription in which um, a mulk sacrifice was performed for the god Eshum. And Eshum, as we know, is actually uh, a Mesopotamian god going back to, I believe, either uh, Ninurta or, or Nergal, one of those two being an, uh, a young Anunnaki god. And Otto Eisfeld believed that the early Israelites kind of constructed, playfully constructed the archetype of Molech to distance themselves from their early history of child sacrifice as well, to kind of create this archetype and cultural context around these Ammonites and so on and so forth, to distance themselves and kind of cover up for the fact that they also shamefully used to worship their god Yahweh under similar circumstances of child sacrifice. And I want to just add real quick as I looked up child sacrifice. So if, the, if there were sites... I forgot what, where was the site with the, with, was it her name? Caitlin, you said, what was her name? Yeah. Carthage was Carthage. And I looked up here, child sacrifice sites in Mesopotamia. And apparently this is 2018. The eight human sacrifice sa sacrifices were positioned just outside the tomb located at the site of Basir Hoyuk, Hoyuk in southeastern Turkey, the researchers said the team determined that the age of six of the human sacrifices found victims. So they found human sacrifices surrounding ancient Mesopotamian tombs. So this could have, again, it could potentially, how you're saying, go back to even like the Anunnaki. And maybe they were appeased with sacrifices as well. Which is the god that liked the smell of burning, of burning fat? Was that Yahweh? Um, yeah, that story is told in Genesis after the flood. I believe after the flood, they, they <laughs> threw up a barbecue and God was like, hmm, yo, let me get some of that. <laughs> <It smells laughs> so you guys good, ain't though. bad after all, man. Yeah, interesting. But yeah, it, it goes back quite some ways. Yeah, yeah, dude. So uh, so Otto realized that there was this weird like cover up happening and there are reflections in the Bible of early Israelite mulk sacrifices, one of them being Zephaniah 1b. There's a strange sentence in Zephaniah 1b that a lot of theologians have wrestled with. And in that verse, we are told that God declared punishment of a particular set of people who, and I quote, swear by the Lord and that swear by Malcolm, Malcolm. And so people have read that as like, he's, he's condemning people who swear by the Lord, I guess, like use the Lord's name in vain. And that also swear by, or no, sorry, that swear by the Lord and that swear by Malcolm. So the way that's been read is that God is condemning people who worship two gods that worship Yahweh and worship Malcolm and Malcolm being kind of a rendition of, of Moloch or, or Molech. So a lot of theologians say, it says right here that God doesn't want you worshiping other gods, but if we read it in the Hebrew, it would say swear by the Lord and that swear by Mulk. And it's that and that swear by Mulk that Otto Eisfeld started to break down and analyze further. And him and many other scholars have, have now read that as God condemning people who worship God and worship him through Mulks, who worship him through ritual child sacrifice. Would that be? So to, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Would that be indicative that that's like, like a Satan archetype? Would that be like the evil, right? And, but not through him. Would that be indicative of the opposite of, of good, of God at all? Is there anything there? Or am I just making that up? Uh, I mean, there could be, but then we're, we're kind of getting into the whole, we're getting into the whole issue that, that we're at, we're at now, you know, kind of like adding on to it, adding on to the archetype and the exaggeration, you know, mm -hmm. it could be there. Like it could be there if we picked it apart. But what Otto Eisfeld was saying is that in that verse, Zephaniah 1b, what's being said is that the early Israelites used to, used to worship Yahweh through child sacrifice. Because again, to him, Mulk didn't mean a deity. It meant a type mm. of uh, offering, type, type of, of sacrifice. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. I got you. I got you. I got you. All right, all right. Yeah, because I'm still, again, I'm, I'm still looking at it from like, oh, this is a, this is an entity, right? So it's like yeah. you got God, but hey, don't, don't talk about the other guy, right? Like hold the whole Satan thing in your first book and and Lucifer in, in your second book, I think yep. it was, where you were like, hey, this is like 
made up <laughs> and then you go yeah. and you back it up with the evidence like this is what this says. and when you start to look at it that way because you're not taught that you go damn this, this mexican is spitting some shit, bro you know what i'm saying <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah dog. we do a whole lot we do a whole lot uh aside from building pyramids and making burritos yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> but uh yeah so so i felt was realizing you know this was indication of early israelite child sacrifice and it's not far-fetched for one because everybody around them was doing it right and the story of abraham is also a reflection of this in genesis 2 2 2 angel numbers we are told specifically that abraham was commanded by God to take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. So right there, Yahweh was telling Abraham to perform a mulk sacrifice for him. I mean, that's pretty wild. I think most people overlook that. Of course, it's like broken down by a lot of theologians to mean all kinds of different yeah. things. But for face value... God was comfortable enough and Abraham was comfortable enough with the idea of a child being it wasn't his burnt first, alive. It wasn't his first time. It wasn't. Exactly. Like, I, I don't usually do this. I just, <laughs> I want your firstborn son. And fun fact, I was actually Abraham in a church play at one time, once upon a time. So I had to sacrifice my my son. And it's funny how people, they painted, I was like, oh my Oh my God, he he had so much faith in God that he went up there and he was gonna do it. Like that's how much he believed in God. Like so, oh my, such a good man. Like that. Like they always right. paint it out to be like such a good thing. It's like, bro, you don't understand what you're saying. It's like you wouldn't give up your firstborn son to God or you know sacrifice him. That's how much he believed in the Lord. All right, bro. Yeah. Hi. Right. Imagine like modern day Christians going to your door, like, hi, we're here to take your firstborn son. They go, like, step, you know, step, step like, right up. Yeah, you can fit so many bad boys in here. You know what I'm saying? Like, just load them up in the. Do you believe in Christ? <laughs> Do you love Christ? Where's your son? Yeah, like, that's such, <laughs> you know? again. But yeah, you're absolutely right. I don't think it was his first time uh, accepting milk from the Malcolm. So just, just he, <laughs> he got milked. All right. <laughs> yeah. You got milked, bro. Yeah. Oh, hey, got milk, right? That's a whole nother thing. Well, bro, I mean, like I said, when you first. When I was listening, I was like, hmm, MLK, we know what happened to him, right? That whole thing. And then you got milk. Damn, bro. It's going to change people's Damn. perspective. Now when you drink milk, you're going to be thinking about all the sacrifices. All the people that got really? milked. Milk come. Not not just milk. <laughs> <but> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so of course, um, and I've, I've spoken on this many times in my books and my documentaries, the early Israelites were just a branch of Canaanites. And the Bible tells us that time and time again, and I'm not going to go super deep on that because I've covered that uh, a lot of times in other, other presentations and stuff, but I will give you one example of that. Being in Exodus 6-2, God says to Moses, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob as El Shaddai, God Almighty, but I did not reveal my name Yahweh to them. So we're told in the Bible that God used to be a different person, a different archetype to the ancient Israelites, specifically El Shaddai. And El Shaddai is a Canaanite God. He's the head of the Canaanite pantheon. And so what I'm saying here is that it's obvious through these different stories, through these different MLK contexts in the Bible that the early Israelites did adhere to this practice at some point, and we're slowly moving away from it. Yeah, guilty by association type of thing. And you're, I mean, you're backing it up with the scripture as well, so... Yeah, that's exactly interesting. Exactly. And so getting back to the Ammonites, right, we're told that the Ammonites worship Moloch in the Bible. But in in real history, right, real, real uh, excavations or whatever, we haven't pulled up anything referring to, to Moloch, only things referring to Milcom, which technically is the same thing as Moloch because they go back to the same root word, MLK. But we're also realizing that Milcom wasn't their God's name. It was a title for their God's name because we only find Milcom on certain occasions. But we have found a lot of references among Ammonite um, sites to El. Again, El, the Canaanite god El. So we now believe that Milcom, the Ammonite word Milcom, was just a reference to their god El. Which makes sense because El was the head of the, pan uh, the Canaanite pantheon, which ruled that entire kingdom for many, many centuries which um, 
and I've talked about this in, in my books. A lot of a lot of scholars have talked about have talked about this as well. Yahweh was just a rendition for El, also. So it was just a smooth transition from the old polytheistic Canaanite world into the new Judaic world of Yahweh. And so that's one aspect of this whole Moloch thing, right? This child sacrifice, the MLK, it all referring to basically the Canaanite god El. It all kind of goes back to him, right? And the bull imagery too, that's, that's a huge aspect of this. We're always told that Moloch was this bull figure. He had horns or whatever. That also might have been influenced by El because El is always referred to as the bull of heaven, frequently referred to as the bull of heaven. For example, in an Ugaritic text, Ugarit being um, a part of the ancient Canaanite empire, in this, tech no in this text known as KTU 1.2, we are told, and I read, Straight away turn ye your faces towards the assembly of the convocation at the feet of El, and make obeisance unto the bull, my father El. So it's obvious through a lot of uh, text and images that we found that El was referred to as the bull of heaven and even depicted as so throughout different uh, cultures and stuff like that. And and interestingly, uh, go ahead. The the picture that I pulled up the the the, the typical if you it literally if you look up Moloch it comes up with like this. Where's the? Do you know where that is from? Because like I say, if we haven't found a so yeah, Moloch, Molech, or Molech is the name or term which appears in the Hebrew Bible several times, primarily in the book of Leviticus. The, Bi the Bible strongly condemns practices which are associated with Moloch practices, which appear to have included. But this, let me see if we can find a picture. The picture that, so this is from 1897, Charles Forster in Offering to Moloch. And that's so it's 19th century. And then this one right here, this is the one that I'm talking about. This one. So it's by Der Goetz. Moloch mm -hmm. made seven. The idol Moloch was seven. And Die Alton by Johann Lund. So early 18th century. The Huh. Because it, it, it's yeah. almost like, right, you have like this collective egregore that comes out. And then yep. it's like the whole Baphomet thing where you have Levy. He's the one that everyone knows what Baphomet looks like, but he's just some dude. You know what I'm saying? Like he was just some guy that drew it to give it you know like this this a face to it i guess and then everyone takes that and they just run with it and that's what B baphomet is and it's like well baphomet essentially at first was an entity like moloch wasn't it didn't have a face it didn't have it was just an entity and then you have people putting even look milton even john milton also put a well, i'm sorry william blake 1809 uh, from John Milton's On the Morning of Christ's Nativity. He even has a, a Moloch here. You got the little babies being offered yeah. up to the... Interesting. Yeah, man. And and these guys are all pulling in inspiration from the Bible because, again, the Bible is the primary source for Moloch and the bull imagery of Moloch. That There is no mentions of Moloch and, and like a bull outside of the Bible. All of that comes from the Bible. But as I've, I've demonstrated, outside of the Bible, there is ancient ritual child sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And it has been done um, at these bronze statues, as we've been told. Um, but a lot of these ritual sacrifices have to do with the root word mulk, as we found mm -hmm. among them, MLK. And as Otto Eisfeld realized, Mulk, which can be re translated into Moloch, into Malik, into Malek, was actually referencing a type of sacrifice. And so this is what the early Christian writers and artists such as William Blake didn't understand and didn't realize because yeah. they were just going based off of the Bible story of the Ammonites and Solomon and this and that. Um, again, I'm trying to break down the the... The bias that I've had, the the programming that I've been subjected to right now in this hour that we've been on, just trying <laughs> to break down these walls, and, and it says, like, no, it was a practice. It wasn't a thing. And then these guys are just, they're just illustrating it, right? They're just giving yeah. some fan fiction, right? Like, well, we love Moloch. Yeah. Milk me, milk but me. Again, 
<laughs> but it gets wild because just like in my Lucifer book and all that, just because like in that whole thing, I deconstructed Lucifer, said there's never was a Lucifer, but that doesn't mean there wasn't a certain story or archetype that it was based on that was true. It's kind of the same case here. Yeah, there wasn't a Moloch per se, but there were a lot of different things that it was based on that were true, like the actual sacrifices, like the root word MLK. <clears throat> MLK. But it gets crazy when we start to um, analyze the connection between El, Moloch, and Yahweh. Because as I'm saying here, El was always referred to as the bull, as the bull of heaven. And in uh, the Bible, Yahweh is also referred to as the bull. He's referred to as the bull of Jacob, you know? And so again, throughout a lot of my work and a lot of work of others, we've demonstrated that the Israelites were a branch of the Canaanites. So they, they borrowed and, and, and changed a lot of the Canaanite mythologies and, and culture and stuff like that. Right. And so this whole bull imagery that the Bible was speaking about could have actually just been images of El. So all along, the, these images of a bull that people were sacrificing to could have just been statues of El that they were sacrificing to. And it says here that the epic of Gilgamesh, he slays the bull of heaven. Mm -hmm. And the epic, which again, back to Mesopotamia. So, yeah, because when I think of the bull, I automatically think of... What's his name, man? I freaking forgot. What's the, the lion-headed guy? They would do the bull sacrifices. God, oh, they... Yaldabaoth or whatever? No, not Yaldabaoth. Uh... Oh, I'm not remembering his name. Oh, man. The guy that comes out of the stone. Shit, I don't know. Here, I'll find it. Give me a second. Golly, man. How am I forgetting <laughs> this this guy? Get out of the stone. God, stone. <sighs> Bro, this is so embarrassing, son. Go ahead. I'll, I'll find it. I'll find it. Hold on. For sure. It happens, man. There's too much knowledge in our heads, man. Some of it just disappears. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so this Mithras, whole bull bro, thing, man. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. Ah, Mithras. Yeah, yeah. yeah there you go. Mithras. That's when I, when I think of, like, bull sacrifice and all that. I think of, of that automatically. But he was like a lion-headed serpent. But then you have the story of... of him slaying the bull as well would that be the bull of heaven i mean was that taurus i mean that's a whole astrological thing there just interesting man yeah man so um yeah right so l was referred to as the bull and then going further back than that right because we know that all of it goes back to the anunnaki and the mesopotamian mythology um and lil was also referred to as the bull and in one tale in specific titled The Debate Between Winter and Summer, we read, And Lil set his foot upon the earth like a great bull, and Lil, king of all the lands. And then we have all of those statues, I forget what they're called, but all those statues in ancient Babylon and, and all that yeah. area of those like bull headed uh winged creatures and stuff like that. And so all along, the Bible might have been talking about people worshiping the Anunnaki and sacrificing the children to these bull statues that we do see in Iraq, in ancient Iraq. Right? So these bull-like deities are, are the only thing we've found in ancient times that are anything close yeah. to what is what is described. Interesting. Wow. And the, and the fact that there haven't been any, like, Moloch statues, how we traditionally see, which we saw already is from from really the 19th and 18th century. Interesting, bro. I don't know. And maybe, maybe perhaps, like I said, it's a collective aggregore. People just took it. They ran with it. And also it fits the narrative, bro. Like it fits the narrative. It fits the, the storyline in this book that we've been presented. And I'm not, again, I'm not here to bash on the Bible or nothing like that. I'm not here to say it's fake and gay, but there's always the possibility. <laughs> at least we know that Moloch, might have been fake and gay, right? Like, there's substantial evidence that he could have been made up, and it was just a practice. Yeah. In, in, but then that's messed up because, again, you can get into it, but at the end of it all, I mean, they were essentially worshiping Yahweh or El or, or what you say, who was Enki or Enlil? I always get Enki and Enlil mixed up. And Lil, yeah. Wow. 
Damn, bro. Yeah, so man. Circle. And um, in closing, there's a scholar that I quote in the in documentary called John D. Levinson. He's like a high biblical ac- academician. And he analyzes this whole conundrum between Moloch and ritual sacrifice and realized that a lot of the early mythologies involving El and his son Baal had to do with El sacrificing his son Baal sacrificing his son Baal and then like regretting it afterwards and like hoping for him to resurrect and then Baal would resurrect and that's a whole weird thing connected to like Jesus and stuff too which I don't get into but but there's something weird there too having to do with El and his son being sacrificed and rising back up like three days later but John D. Levinson realized that these ancient people who were sacrificing the Kronos to Saturn which are also renditions of El as well were doing so in reenactment of El sacrificing his son. So it was a weird play. And and they did this hoping to get some kind of value, some kind of uh, some luck or fortune or whatever in this life or the next from El. And it's interesting because eventually this this entire archetype took hold and, and created and helped create and fuel the archetype of hell. Because what do we have in hell? Fire and also a bull creature in which the sinners are sacrificed to. So that all, it all kind of just, just snowballed into more mm-hmm. and more archetypes. And again, Jesus himself, when referring to the afterlife for sinners, always referred to Gehenna, which is the valley in which Moloch was worshipped. Yeah, and, the, and this John D. Levinson, D- Douglas, he's a summa cum laude from uh, Harvard College, 1971. <laughs> We're talking about Mokum and milking him and all that stuff so i just thought that was funny but yeah john d that's a interesting name i wish i had that name but yeah dude like i said it fits the narrative it fits this whole ideology it it solidifies the ideology that we've been taught since forever i mean that's what i've been taught right there's a place that you're gonna burn for eternity in hell if you're not good so you gotta be you gotta behave so it's again i'm not here to say that the bible's the things in it are fake but we have to understand that it is a form of control that they put on people. And some people can look past that, like myself, where I consider myself a Christian. And, and by being a Christian, I mean, like, I think Jesus Christ was a real person. And I think that he was a good guy, like the light. You know, he was teaching good things, which essentially at the core, at the core of it all. We don't have to have all these books. Jesus said, don't be a piece of <laughs> Be kind to your neighbor. Love your mother and your father. Don't murder people. You know what I'm saying? Like, do good yeah. things and be a good person. And then, yeah, you know, and all the, all these all these extracurricular things that they that they put on. It's like at the core of it all, just be good. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's yeah. that simple. Be good. Be a, a a good citizen, and that's it. And not in a good, not in a way of like follow orders from uh, authoritarian governments and all. It's like no, no, like just be a good person. Like, do good. And yeah, that's yeah, the way man. I see it, bro. Yeah, and, and I'm glad you brought up Jesus because in closing of this presentation, that whole story of Jesus sacrificing himself on the cross as the one and only begotten son of Yahweh of essentially El was just another story of Yahweh performing a mulk sacrifice. Yahweh performed oh, a milk sacrifice in front of the entire world. He gave his one and only begotten son in sacrifice. God damn. damn, bro. So. Yeah, man. man. He just dropped the hammer on us right there, bro. That, that, was, that was the LARP. That was the role play. That was the solidification of this whole yes, cosmic sir. story that we've been hearing about. You know, when you, when you, when you, you know, at the beginning of this whole thing, I wasn't expecting that part at the end. So that, that's a good, that's a good, like, you know, punchline. But, you know, for those that hadn't checked out your documentary, I mean, they're going to be in for a treat because you start to see things with, from a different perspective, right? You start to see things from a, a different lens when it comes to all these things. And I do think it goes back to that aspect of being able to play things out in real life. There's something about that that correspondence that energy and uh, it's like ceremonial magic you do the ceremony you send out that energy you come back next sunday 
you take that energy again, you send it back out until next Sunday or next year or whatever it is, and you just keep doing it over and over again. So, damn, bro. That's wild <laughs> to think about it like that. Yeah, man. I know. I When I kind of, like, made that connection, I was like, shh, dude. He like, needs some milk. I need that. I need that sound for my soundboard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Isn't that crazy, man? Like we we get down on we get down on like the elites for sacrificing their children or babies or whatever, and all along, like God did the same thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he said, yeah, exactly. Which is another weird aspect of things that, like, why did he do that? It was the ultimate sacrifice? He loved you so much that he sacrificed yeah. his only son for you. Damn, bro, this dude never met me before. He's like, no, no, he knew you before you were even in, in the womb really yeah yeah he knew it's like bro he didn't have to do all that like yeah. he could just skip the sacrifice a, a part. thank you card would have been nice like he didn't have to do it you know yeah. what I'm just send me a thank you card <laughs> uh what do they call it carnation is that what they call it like flowers and stuff like that anyways yeah. wow bro that that's that's heavy is, is there anything else you wanted to add there at the end it's pretty much it man so you know moloch basically now breaking up eddie bird but you, you know bro- you broke up fun. there already you said moloch something <laughs> oh. something oh can you hear me yeah you're lagging a little bit but i can hear you now oh uh, yeah no i just want to say that that's pretty much it man you know uh check out the video if you want to learn a little bit more more detail but yeah that's it man i i had fun you know i had fun this was great yeah dude and what can people expect from you next is there anything cooking in the moloch oven or are you milking anybody what's going on is there anything in the works i know you told me you're waiting for (laughs) inspiration but maybe you can write a book about this or maybe an essay or something yeah man i'm always working on stuff always working on stuff instagram esoteric eddie youtube esoteric eddie tv i am getting ready to write the fourth book um i may write it on the historicity of jesus i think i might finally sit down and look at this one once and for all nice well i'll post all the links in the description as always make sure to check eddie out he's a friend of the show since for a long time now and yeah make sure to check me out at the one-on-one podcast on pretty much all social media platforms tjojp.com make sure to leave a five-star review thumbs up comment share all that good stuff and as always everyone Catch you on the other side. Bye now.